Good afternoon. Welcome to Nova Southeastern University. Uh, we are going to have a presentation today. Uh, Ask the expert fears about COVID variants and the vaccine with Dr. Johannes Buber. And uh, one of the first things I'd like to just start off with a quick little poll so we could see who's there. And you should be able to see the poll now. I'm attending the webinar today as a student, a mental health professional, a community member, a medical professional, an educator, an NSU alum, other. About 70% of our audience has participated. So I'm gonna end the poll in just three, two, one, and poll and share your results. You can see that uh, mostly educators, so there's probably a lot of individuals from NSU there. Uh, we also get a lot of teachers and school psychologists on these programs, and we've got some NSU alums. Thank you, welcome everyone. One other very quick little poll. I had a little fun with this one. So um, this is anonymous and it is optional. Um, I am fully vaccinated and ready to rock and roll. That seems to be a very popular answer. I'm nervous and waiting. I have medical concerns. I am waiting out for major gift cards. So after I got mine, I you started seeing gift cards for 10 bucks, uh, $10. So, uh, I am just here for a lunchtime company. And uh, we've got a lot of individuals voting. So we're gonna close that in three, two, one. And you can see the results. Most people here are, uh, ready to rock and roll. And uh, hopefully they're here to gather some information to share with their friends. So uh, we do have uh, the Dean from the College of, of Allopathic Medicine, uh, the uh, Johannes Vuberg, and uh, he's the founding Dean here at this college. And he's received his medical degree from the Technical University of Munich. He's done uh, work at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Duke University, University of Florida, and now NSU, Florida. So he's got quite a bit of experience with vaccines and um, it's really a pleasure to have you here today. And uh, please proceed. So I just would like to welcome the audience and uh, particularly thank Karen Grosby and um, Carlos Perez for organizing this Shark Chat. Uh, we have done this uh, before, uh, a similar meeting uh, as the pandemic just started. Uh, now we are in a different situation and I think that uh, looking at where we are in a pandemic and what to do is very appropriate and um, I wanted to give you some information, you know, how to deal with uh, the post-COVID situation, how to deal with the current COVID situation that's still lingering around us and you know what the best uh, action would be to uh, with regard to vaccinations as it relates to different strains of the vaccine etc so i have a lot of experience with vaccination i uh, you know developed uh, several vaccines myself that are based on the mrna platform in the early 90s and i can share a lot of hopefully valuable information to you regarding vaccine safety, what has been done. And uh, for those who are nervous, uh, tell you a little bit more about what our experiences are with mRNA vaccines that are not new. They have been around now for 35 years and uh, I'm happy to share any information with you today. So um, I'm, uh, as, as we did before, I would like to invite questions through the chat if you have any and um, you know, talk to you a little bit more about, you know, what you need to know uh, if you have any issues. Uh, otherwise, I just want to tell you that um, we are currently in a, in a third quarter of a pandemic that um, has different rules and regulations. You can see uh, when you watch the news that there are a diversity of opinions, how to mask, if we should mask or not mask. The CDC has different guidelines than the World Health Organization. And also recommendations are different from state to state because state legislatures looking at this more from a state level and uh, you know, the, there are significant differences in vaccination rate among states here in the United States. 
My personal opinion is that all those recommendations are based on statistics. Uh, statistics that um, government official or health officials receive uh, through public health services or through uh, services within their state. My goal is really to provide a very tailored, customized advice to you what you should do that is not just predicated on what the CDC or what government officials tell you, but more what is your individual risk. Um, you know, also what is your environment, how may, what's the vaccination status where you live, and how particularly also to protect your loved ones and your children's if you have any. Uh, so there are different uh, recommendations that need to be addressed, you know, more on a customized level, uh, also depending where you live and where your bubble is and uh, who's around you here. So um, I just wanted to invite some questions uh, and I see the first one here. Is the vaccine safe for, what is it, Portillo people with autoimmune disease, or protect probably, is the vaccine safe and protect people with autoimmune diseases such as Hashimoto's disease, uh, etc.? So <clears throat> in medicine, Mary, uh, this was uh, uh, asked by Mary Ann McCorrow. Um, you know, Mary, the, the issue is that these questions are never black and white. I think that the vaccines are safe, uh, but uh, in people with uh, autoimmune diseases or with immune deficiencies, these vaccines have shown to cause side effects that can be you know, intermediate, non-existing, or very severe, depends on the disease. So what happens with Hashimoto is that if you stimulate your immune system, you also stimulate your autoimmune disease to some extent, and you have to figure out, you know, what is my risk of acquiring COVID? Uh, and what is my risk of uh, making Hashimoto's worse? So Hashimoto is uh, a, a disease that uh, affects your thyroid gland. And uh, I would recommend for you to be cautious about this because um, the regulations or the current recommendations are uh, to, you know, be cautious or talk to your physician about the risk and benefits. So in medicine, it's all about risk. So, and you have to figure out, you know, what is my risk of aggravating my disease? Right now, your risk of dying from COVID is between one and 5% dependence where you live and depends on your health status. So that's quite a significant risk. Um, in the end, right now, what we see right at this point is that we have a two-tiered society. One, one part of our society is vaccinated. We are approaching 70% uh, nationwide, but there are 30% who are unvaccinated. And these are the ones who have significant risk of dying from COVID. So I would recommend Mary to go back to your physician, to your, uh, to your provider and get good recommendations because he has more information than I do regarding your Hashimoto's disease and how severe it is. And, uh, you know, can, what are the consequences of further aggravating this? So I cannot tell you get vaccinated, but I recommend to go back to your physician and get better advice uh, on your risk of vaccinated versus, um, you know, acquiring COVID. All right, I'm going back here. The, the questions are coming in. Um, the next question I see here is, um, Will booster shots become the norm for the future of those who have been fully vaccinated? So uh, I think that really is a good question and I strongly believe in booster shots. I wanna give you some information on boosters. So it is known now that after Pfizer, Moderna and uh, J&J vaccinations, your antibody count is uh, going down after three to four months. So the issue is this, that active antibodies that tackle the virus are going down after a couple of months. And there's no question in my mind that a booster shot will benefit fit you uh, something in, the, in a period of nine to 12 months. So that is uh, an experience that I have personally with uh, mRNA vaccines. I know that Pfizer and Dr. Fauci, which means the NIH are talking right now about the appropriate timing for revaccination. I believe that one year is reasonable. It could be as early as nine months. It depends on your antibody titer. Um, but you know, the good news is that we have so, a so-called immunological memory after vaccination that 
actually leads to good protection if the, even after nine, 10, 11, or 12 months. So you're not unprotected uh, during that time period. But I think that from a, uh, from a immunological standpoint, having a booster shot after one year is a good thing. And I think that's what we should do as we move forward with the vaccination, uh, as we uh, in, forward with this pandemic. What I wanted to tell you, uh, Carlos, I think, um, forgot, um, no, Roland uh, asked the question, that um, it depends on, uh, you know, how the virus mutates. So it's similar to flu, uh, because we have a new flu strain every year, and vaccinations are adjusted to the new flu strain. Uh, it, it needs to be seen, you know, whether we encounter a new uh, COVID strain, you know, after this pandemic is over. And I, I will let you know, you know, if this happens, I think this would be publicized in the news and new vaccines would be made available because with the mRNA platform, and I'm a great advocate of this, we have a great flexibility in vaccine design. So we can adjust uh, vaccines dependence on the strain actually in record time within months and get a new product out in real time. So I wouldn't worry about that, but I would listen closely uh, when finally Pfizer will receive approval by the NIH for revaccination, and we should do that. All right, going down the list here. Uh, Teresa Bell was asking statistics about daily transmissions, hospitalizations uh, have largely disappeared. Many use this information to make informed decision about engaging socially wearing masks. And what we, would you recommend that people do to stay informed to make safe choices uh, without this information? Really good question, Teresa. And right now we are in a kind of a gray zone where you know, recommendations vary and uh, also the informations are disappearing because it is really hard to track down those so-called hotspots of not vaccinated individuals uh, with a population vaccination rate of about 70%. So actually you would have to, in order to provide um, more broader recommendation, you would have to develop a heat map within the United States, you know, who is vaccinated, who is not. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just read some data from uh, the state of Missouri that uh, has not been uh, very well vaccinated uh, because of uh, the acceptance of the population there towards vaccination where the virus doubles has, has actually led to uh, an 100% increase of cases uh, that uh, are very worrisome. So what you see here is a scatter plot throughout the United States where you have largely vaccinated areas that are pretty well protected. Uh, and then you have spots that are not protected and this is where the virus lives. And this is particularly where the Delta variant lives uh, that you, know, you probably already you know, read about. So I think on an individual basis, um, you know, there are trusted resources that I go to. You know, honestly, I, I know a lot about this and I get a lot of information actually, not just through the internet, but also through communications with CDC and, and the NIH. I would go to the CDC website right now and listen what they have to say. They're adjusting their guidelines and uh, recommendations, you know, in, on an as needed basis. And I think that going to the CDC website is your best source for information that also avoids some of the political influences that we've seen uh, in, uh, throughout this pandemic here. So if you wanna have more information about that, um, just go to the CDC website and uh, listen to them what they have to say. Um, how damaging, Philip Fortman was asking, how damaging is Florida's governor DeSantis outlawing COVID passports for our community and the cruise ship industry? Um, good question. I'm not going into the politics of this, but um, you know, anonymizing vaccine status has not helped us very much, uh, to be honest to you, to get to a herd immunity vaccination status that is about 70 to 80 percent of the population being vaccinated. So once you reach that threshold of 70 to 80 percent, the virus typically dies off and cannot mutate anymore. So I think we have not reached that threshold. And despite the fact that you know the uh, that uh, Joe Biden's goal of having 70 percent uh, within our population has not been reached by a couple of percent, uh, I think it's just enormous that we got to that number uh, and that we have that acceptance rate of vaccines. We are still dealing here with 30 to 35% of our population that 
categorically denies a vaccination for multiple reasons. Don't want to go into this, but um, I have to say, you know, it certainly hasn't made our life easier to track vaccination status and declare a success due to herd immunity if you don't know uh, the vaccination status of your people. So I think it is complicated. It complicates matters. And right now, what we are going to is uh, the COVID incidence, you know, in our community that gives you a pretty good impression, you know, what your vaccination status is. If the COVID numbers uh, don't move or go down, I think that your vaccination rate is likely to go be high, but um, it is a complicating factor in for an epidemiologist or for a immunologist. Uh, Timothy Canova is asking, what is the survival rate for COVID without one of the vaccines? So it's not really the survival rate, it's a risk rate of getting COVID and dying from it. So the numbers uh, really depend uh, from, from individual to individual. They also depend on your immune status, uh, which means that some people are more susceptible. Some people are earlier developing antibodies or T cells against the virus, and that is hard to measure. So uh, there is no black and white answer. But I have to tell you that, you know, the mortality rate, the death rate from COVID in an unvaccinated individual is likely between two and three percent, even higher. Uh, you know, for the uh, new Delta mutant uh, that uh, has been uh, particularly uh, troublesome right now in those areas where vaccines have not been fully executed. So the question is now for you, if you have a one to 3% risk of dying from something, I think it's significant. And the best way of getting protected from them, if you reduce that risk, you know, dying from uh, COVID, you know, to zero, I mean, through a vaccination, I think that's a very reasonable way. Let me ask you, you know, when you go in, drive your car, you know, you have a certain risk of getting into a car crash, you know, or in an accident and maybe even dying from that, but you still wear a seatbelt. So look at a vaccine as a seatbelt, you know, for your, you know, while driving your car or while living your life here. And I think it wouldn't make sense to me to say, the risk is only one to three percent, and uh, you know that's why I'm not taking the vaccine. So I can clearly state that the benefits of the vaccine clearly outweigh the risk with vaccination. So um, it's it's a risk, and it's particularly a risk, you know, with the alpha variant, uh, with the delta variant of um, uh, of COVID-19 that is troublesome right now and has actually doubled the risk for COVID-19 uh, hospitalization. So um, I think about 10, 20% uh, of individuals get hospitalized who are freshly infected with COVID have to go to the hospital. Um, but uh, Delta seems to be particularly troublesome uh, because of its better affinity to uh, the human cells here. Um, can you, uh, Karen is asking, can you explain what emergency approval means as many are hesitant for that reason. So emergency approval still means that a drug company has to conduct a study uh, at, uh, with a significant power. So there are power calculations going on to show a statistical benefit uh, for the vaccine. What emergency approval does not do is looking at long-term effects. So emergency approvals look at short-term toxicities and side effects from a vaccine um, you know, the full approval is uh, given once uh, long-term data are available, you know, to show that uh, after COVID vaccination, the long-term effects after COVID vaccination. So, and these approvals are still pending. So it was expected that by September, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine would get full FDA approval. But I think they're looking currently at some cases of autoimmune disease. I think another uh, individual ask for Hashimoto's, but um, so there are some cases of endocarditis uh, that have been reported, or some cases of autoimmune disease that have been evoked by a vaccine, which is not unusual. And we have to look into that, are these issues vaccine related? So the big question is, you know, you may get endocarditis one or the other way, you know, because of uh, a genetic predisposition or some other issue that's going on with you, but 
the linkage to the vaccine with all these side effects that you're reading about has not been clearly established. So I would be very cautious to go into um, you know, uh, conclusions before long-term data are available, which also may influence the full approval of the uh, COVID vaccines. Uh, Monique is asking, my husband and I are fully vaccinated, but we are nervous about school starting in the fall because our kids age seven to nine are not able to get vaccinated yet. Do we know how soon younger children will be able to get the vaccine? So, so actually uh, trials are, have already started and uh, the profile is extraordinarily beneficial. I mean, there's nothing known right now about serious side effects in this, uh, in this group. Um, you know that um, the recommendations have um, moved now to, uh, I forgot about age 15 to 20. So their study already done. <clears throat> Monique, the issue is, <clears throat> you know, if you are fully vaccinated <clears throat> and um, we have to go back to normal at some point, and uh, I think the risk cannot be fully mitigated, but if your kids are seven to nine, <clears throat> there seems to be, you know, better protection in with younger age as com uh, compared to older individuals. I still would send my children to school. Um, uh, we will have by then in the fall better guidelines as to you know particularly in that age group but i'm pretty positive that kids that age between seven and nine or ten will get vaccination uh most likely in september october of this year so that may be not too maybe too late for your children here but i think this is what's going on but uh, the risk of dying from covid for children is uh, fairly low and uh, it has been shown that children are more carriers rather than having symptoms from COVID. I'm not trying to trivialize this and I don't wanna expose my kids to COVID either, but um, I think with more and more people getting vaccinated, the virus will die off and will not find as many targets as it did in the beginning of the pandemic. That's my best answer to your question. Um, then April is asking if I have already a COVID wouldn't my body naturally create antibodies? Uh, good question, and your body will create antibodies uh, and will have some illogical memory. The issue is just not all antibodies are relevant you know, to tackle COVID. So most of the antibodies that the vaccines are inducing are directed against the so-called spike protein, which is the protein that connects the virus with human cells. And this is a real good target because without that protein, uh, then the virus cannot attach to uh, our body, to our upper respiratory tract. And um, it wouldn't really, um, you know, affect us at all. You know, once that protein is eliminated or attacked by antibodies or T cells. So um, the issue is just if you had COVID, I would still get the vaccine at some point. The recommendations are to wait a couple of months after you had COVID, but um, you know, the issue is what the vaccine does, it shifts your immune response to a better target than the COVID infection would likely uh, provide you with because uh, you can get antibodies against multiple parts of the virus, which does not help with suppressing the virus from here on. Kathy Schaefer is asking, will booster shots be changed to include the Delta variant? Uh, yes, it will be. And uh, as I mentioned, that the spike protein on Delta has a slightly different antigenic profile that can be easily addressed, um, especially with mRNA. <clears throat> so we don't have to reinvent the wheel and create a completely new vaccine. Um, it is also shown that actually current vaccination has a protective effect against Delta. So um, I wouldn't really worry too much about it right now. See, uh, there are two factors. It's the efficiency of the vaccine and the immune status of the population. If we get to 70, 80%, even if you don't have an adjustment for Delta, the virus will die off and uh, it won't be an issue until a new variant emerges that has a different antigenic profile. And I don't think that Delta is that different. What you need to know about Delta is it's more contagious. It is more contagious because the receptor of the virus 
to human cells is much more, um, you know, more eager, is, is better, there's higher affinity, there's more sticking power of that receptor to human cells. So this is a highly contagious variant uh, that can be mitigated by mask wearing, but <clears throat> is still, you know, a threat. Um, the issue is I mentioned before that infections with Delta doubles hospitalization. So if you get become symptomatic, uh, if you have a problems with the Delta virus, uh, you have a higher risk of getting hospitalized. It's also interesting that the Delta strain causes different symptoms. So <clears throat> if you are infected by Delta, um, the symptoms of Delta are more comparable to a common cold with runny nose, a itchy nose or something like this, and not with cough uh, or with uh, a sensory loss of smelling. So it's interesting that it causes different symptoms, but um, it seems like that um, this attachment of the virus to the respiratory cells also causes different uh, symptoms here. And it also uh, is, it's affecting children more than uh, historic controls did. So I think the previous question about, you know, uh, should I protect my children? The answer is absolutely yes. And especially with Delta, I mean, kids get more symptomatic with Delta. They don't die from Delta, but they become more symptomatic from Delta than with the viral type virus. So, the issue is I believe that Pfizer has already worked on, on a vaccine that uh, includes epitopes that are encoded by the Delta virus. So I think the answer is yes to your question. Can you explain what the messenger RNA platform means? Um, so um, this is typically vaccines are taking a virus and killing it and using the a, an attenuated or killed virus as a vaccine that is recognized by your uh, by your body. So this is kind of the old fashioned design of a vaccine. And this was uh, particularly cumbersome because you had to isolate the virus, you had to kill it, you have to modify it, you have to do a study. And then also you had much higher risk that some of these so-called killed viruses are still active. And uh, uh, that's kind of a safety concern that I personally don't like and that kind of prompted to look for other vaccine platforms. So mRNA is, you know, is basically a, a genetic information that encodes for the spike protein of the virus. So you can engineer uh, the messenger RNA and you only get a piece of the virus and not the entire virus. So you can't get an infection from COVID with a vaccine because the vaccine only encodes for a strip uh, of the virus, which is called the spike protein, what I mentioned before. So all what this does is when I inject the mRNA in your body, that the body converts the RNA into a spike protein, into a small piece of the virus in a very defined fashion. Um, and once the body sees that protein, not the RNA, the RNA needs to be converted into the protein and the protein is then recognized by immune cells, either B cells or T cells. B cells produce antibodies, T cells improves, uh, produce cytotoxic lymphocytes, which both are highly effective against this protein. So what it does is it multiplies a bunch of cells in your body that are mobilized and that are available for a virus that is attaching to your body. So as soon as the virus attaches to your body, these cells and antibodies you know, are going there and they're killing the virus uh, upon entry. So it's a, actually a very preventive mode of dealing with um, uh, you know, the virus, uh, which will not uh, get entry into your body. So I think this is why the mRNA vac uh, vaccination is so interesting. So the, the positive component of the mRNA uh, vaccine is that we're only dealing with a small protein of the virus, not with the virus itself. So if you get sick after vaccination, it's not because you have virus on board, you can't get virus through the vaccine, but you can, but what it does is that it uh, activates your, your body to create immune cells against this little piece of that virus that in itself has no activity. So I hope I explained that as much as I can, but um, it's a very slick way right now to create safer vaccines that do not um, enable uh, you know, viral spread in, in the human body. Um, if I, what is that here? Um, 
Will booster shots be changed? Oh, I, I already had that, I'm sorry. Uh, there is Janet Santa, can the COVID-19 substitute the flu shot or do you recommend get both vaccines? No, simple question, you have to get both. So I think your question is not, is, is really good though because we did some studies that some of the epitopes, so these are the attachment sites that create those antibodies and T cells are sometimes shared among viruses. So your question is pretty smart in my opinion, because there are some overlaps between uh, two viruses, but unfortunately flu and COVID, uh, the epitopes are different. And uh, in the end, you have to get both. Uh, I would not recommend to get it at the same time. I would really time that uh, because your, you know, your body reacts to both vaccines at the same time. So uh, you don't want to get sick too much, uh, you know, once you get vaccine shots. So I would, uh, you know, recommend to uh, take both vaccines, you know, maybe a month or two apart. So that's uh, a pretty safe recommendation from a medical standpoint. There's Desiree Rivera asking, hi, which shouldn't be social distance anymore? Uh, good question. Um, so the issue is just if you, uh, this is not a yes or no answer. So your question is very loaded because there are so many gray zones. It really depends on, you know, where you are, what the vaccination status is, um, and, um, you know, what the risk is of acquiring uh, COVID. So I think in public places where you have no control over and you don't know what the vaccination status is, I, I would agree. I think let's wear masks. Uh, I don't think you, the, uh, there's a, you know, the distance of six feet versus three feet, there's an exact science around this, but I think that we still should protect ourselves based on how well protected you wanna be. I think if, you know, I feel more confident having been vaccinated twice, that my risk of getting COVID is, um, you know, fairly low. I mean, honestly, I could still get COVID despite in the my vaccination. But uh, if I get COVID, uh, I don't have symptoms. I still can get be a carrier. But I think the issue is just the question is why shouldn't we social distance? It protects those who have not been vaccinated. So that's it's really a, a rule or a a precaution for those who have not received the vaccine. And, um, you know, that's uh, something, you know, if I would not be vaccinated, I would be very, very careful. Um, I would protect myself with masks and social distancing. But if you are um, fully vaccinated, your risk of um, having bad side effects from COVID are very, very minimal. So this is the best protection you can get. And if you, if you haven't gotten your vaccine yet, please get it, then you don't have to worry about that anymore. And uh, we can go back to, hopefully back to normal. So uh, Carlos Perez kind of put the link uh, of our VaxMax program online and uh, it gives you really good information and it also shows you, you know, uh, looks at your vaccination status, which also helps us on our campus, how to manage our campus because the social distancing and the uh, masking mandate is totally dependent on whether we reach that 70 to 80 percent threshold of protection uh, and actually it make, would make it much much easier on our campus to go back to normal once we have reached uh, those herd immunity levels which will make the virus die off uh, quicker than than some people think. Uh, hi there's Rob Spith. Hey I haven't seen you for a long time but um, he is asking a question, COVID-19 is a global problem. So even if we could convince an adequate proportion of the US population to get vaccinated, there's still a potential of appearance of variants in parts of worldwide vaccines are available. Such variants could expect protection, et cetera. Yeah, I think of course it's a, it's a pandemic. So it's a global problem. And I think the issues that we currently see in India and in other countries, uh, you know, are significant. Um, uh, the, the, the question is, does it's more quantitative issue? If the United States uh, reaches 70-80%, uh, you are pretty well protected, even from people coming in who carry the COVID virus. It's the same, you know, it's, it's a, I think, a, a pretty easy mathematics to show that vaccination protects you and whatever goes on in the world 
we have to help other countries, you know, to get to that same level as we do, which uh, will happen in a probably in a delayed fashion because some of the countries can't afford the vaccine. So uh, the point is just that your best protection is get vaccinated, and uh, it's it's very liberating to be honest to you, knowing that you have immunity, and also knowing that people around you are protected, which really makes the virus stop from multiplying. So all that variant stuff is a matter of the vaccination status throughout the world. If we get to the 70, 80% threshold, we are past the pandemic and we can back to, uh, get back to normal. I think we are almost at 10 to 12 uh, with regard to the, the pandemic. We are not ready yet, but uh, we're getting there. And um, I think if we can convince everybody you know, to get vaccinated, I think we would be there. You say that mRNA vaccines have been around for 35 years, correct. Have they been used on human beings before? Yes. Have ever been long-term clinical trials on human beings? Yes. So the answer is yes, and I can you know, give you some references. Of course, these mRNA vaccines have not been used for COVID because it's a relatively new virus with a modified spike protein that affects humans, has not done that before, but uh, there are multiple vaccines, long-term effects that I'm aware of that have been uh, safe. Uh, there are small incidences of autoimmunity like with every vaccine, but I think in terms of the risk profile, it has not been any different than for the flu vaccines, just as a comparator. I just wanna let you know about that. So it's nothing suspicious. There is no evidence of gene transmission from mRNA. I know that in my discussions with the FDA, they were concerned, could uh, RNA be converted into DNA and could that go into the human genome? These studies all have been done and they have not shown any evidence that uh, there is any uh, genetic transmission of uh, uh, COVID RNA into the human genome. So uh, I can assure you that uh, the trials that have been conducted in 30 years ago have shown safety. Um, and uh, again, I'm not uh, concerned about that platform at all. Actually, I'm intrigued by the flexibility of that platform to create a new vaccine in the case a new strain is uh, emerging. All right, uh, there's another question. Um, uh, Carlos Perez is giving us a couple of links online. Um, Kathy Schaefer is asking, I know a lot of people that are fully vaccinated have recently got COVID. What are the risks of a fully vaccinated high person getting very sick of, uh, to get COVID? So if you know a lot of people, then you are in a unique situation because it is quite rare uh, to get COVID after vaccination. Um, you get COVID, uh, you can get COVID early on in the, during the priming phase of the vaccine. So if somebody had exposure to COVID and the virus is already kind of, you know, attacking your, uh, your body, um, it's um, even, and, and you get vaccinated, it's too late. I mean, it's too late not to get COVID, to be honest to you. So you're still protected after a while. But the point is just, I said that the mRNA vaccine is a preventive max vaccine. So if you have virus in your body, it doesn't help you. You have to get, fight the virus yourself with your immune cells, but it uh, protects you from the attachment of the virus to your body. So I think it has a different uh, action spectrum that you have to be aware of. Uh, the risk of getting uh, COVID after full vaccination is less than 1%. So it's a rare event uh, happens. Uh, but as I said, it has been shown in those who had breakthrough infections, that's what we call it, have uh, modest symptoms, uh, can still transmit virus, but um, the risk of hospitalization is virtually zero, which is you know, a good thing here. Uh, question here. My 28-year-old son had open heart surgery six years ago. He was born um, with, uh, uh, with an anom anomaly of his cardiovascular system. He's afraid to get the vaccination. What's your suggestion? I think that there's no... Uh, the issue is this immune system deficiency is completely different and open heart surgery doesn't affect your immune system. So uh, I would still uh, consult with your physician, but I don't see any uh, problem. Actually, I would say it's even protective to have him vaccinated 
you know, there's uh, always concerns after open heart surgery to get endocarditis or any issues like that, which is a potential side effect of vaccination. But, uh, you know, you need to talk to your doctor and discuss risk and benefits. I'm always erring, erring more on the cautious side, but uh, personally, I think that um, the, the risk of getting sick from the vaccine is very low uh, because he's not immune compromised and he will do fine after vaccination. That's my personal opinion without knowing his uh, immune profile. So what we do is we get lab data first that gives us better ideas, you know, to make decisions, you know, whether somebody should get the vaccine or not. Karen is asking, what is the major reason some get a reaction to the vaccine, sometimes more severe and sometimes not anything? That's a real good question. I said that in medicine, nothing is black and white. So every person has a different immune competence. That's what we call it, uh, meaning that your immune cells react, you know, sometimes more aggressive and sometimes less. Uh, it also has been shown, for example, with hepatitis B vaccination that some people do not uh, uh, produce antibodies and they have to get revaccinated. So the threshold of getting an immune response is different from individual to individual. And um, as I said, that um, we know now that two Pfizer vaccines create antibodies in 96, 7% of people. Uh, I would, I'm convinced that a third shot would bring it to 100%, but that's just not something what we are focusing on right now. So the issue is just, that we call this an immune threshold, meaning that um, you have to tickle the immune system to certain degrees or to in certain intervals to really produce an antibody response unless you know, you're immune compromised. And that's a personal issue. And it makes it very difficult you know, to say who's protected and who's not because every individual is, is, is different here. Christian De Luca, uh, information provided thus far has been great. So thank you for that. Can you talk about decisions being made at NSU about the fall semester? The present data suggests that about 95% um, on the Fort Lauderdale campus are vaccinated and 30% uh, are reporting their, uh, their status. So let me, let me say what the current thinking is. Of course, I think we all have one goal. And I think this is this herd immunity, reaching this herd immunity on our campus as a bubble, as an ecosystem that really protects us pretty well from viruses to spread, get transmitted. Actually, you know, if you reach that 70%, uh, I think things uh, are getting much, much better because the virus doesn't find its target under, unless, you know, there's a, you know, an exceptional anomaly going on right now here. So I think the president is very concerned reaching that threshold. And I think this is a goal. You can also see that on national data, President Biden put out, you know, a goal of 70% um, <clears throat> vaccination rates to other country that was barely missed, but, um, and also the vaccination rates today are really going down and some of the COVID infections are going up in those states, you know, who have not been vaccinated, which is not surprising. So I think that from a policy standpoint, it's, uh, you know, we, we, we cannot, unless you know you're an employee, we cannot mandate people to get vaccinated. We are a free country. Um, that's uh, unfortunately though, it has, it costs some people their lives to be free. Uh, and I think it really doesn't make sense from a risk standpoint. You know, if you are somebody who is saying, well, the vaccine A is too risky, I think I would tell you there's very little evidence that the vaccine is risky. Uh, you know, if you have religious belief, I don't want to go into that. That's uh, entirely up to the individual. But, you know, if somebody just has a bad feeling about this, I wanted to convince those people who are still kind of on. Uh, undecided, please get vaccinated because it's the best thing you can do to end the pandemic. The pandemic will end in probably in, in two ways, uh, in one way, that we have vaccinated people and then we have people with COVID and that's kind of sad. There will be nobody who will get spared by either one. And uh, that's just where we're going right now. If you decide not to get vaccinated, you will get COVID. I can guarantee you that because that's just, uh, because you're creating a source for the virus uh, to find somebody who will be COVID naive 
meaning that they didn't have COVID or didn't get vaccinated is virtually zero. So I think this is what we're going in and this is the risk that you have to take. I just don't wanna abuse you know, the freedom of uh, our country to expose you know, especially children to the COVID virus. So if you are a non-vaccinated individual, you, I guarantee you will get COVID at some point unless you, know, get, you get vaccinated and you will transmit this to your young children. So don't do that because I think this is irresponsible. And uh, I think I you know, think this really doesn't make any sense. Um, in, in terms of the campus policy, I think Dr. Hanbury will send out new policies. Um, I can just report out that the acceptance rate in our medical college is tremendous. And I wanted to thank my students to reach the 70% threshold of uh, vaccination and reporting their vaccination. And I think that's uh, something what I'm very proud of by talking to them almost every week through town halls and uh, educating both faculty and students about the need for vaccination. Um, Ra uh, Vijay is asking any effective methods to motivate or incentivize students to facilitate campus to get vaccinated. So I think that, you know, there are two issues involved in here. Number one is the vaccination and B is the reporting. And the reporting actually is, in my opinion, is more the bottleneck here. So uh, people are just not willing to put their data out on a website and uh, despite the fact that they get vaccinated and we have to, you know, talk to them effectively that, you know, this is actually something that helps us to go back to normal. So if we reach that 70 to 80% threshold, we can take our mask off in, uh, in our educational setting. So I think people wouldn't have to have mask and uh, the social distancing uh, would fall away because the risk of transmission in a 70 or 80% vaccinated population is, is really very, very low. And um, that's a risk that I would take. Uh, if you're not reaching that threshold, you still have to wear your mask and uh, social distance, at least on our campus here. And I think that would make sense to me. Uh, in terms of motivation and incentivization, yeah, right now we do raffles, we try to get prizes and other stuff. And uh, uh, what Carlos Perez did, you know, I'm still waiting for my uh, reward of getting vaccinated, you know, th this, these are just games. I think that uh, information and uh, communication is key. And I think the efficiency of our communication can be measured by the amount of people who take the vaccine. So I think that uh, speaking from my own college, I think we, you know, are reiterating this every week and uh, we're making progress both on the front of the faculty and uh, the students. And I think by August 1st, I think we will reach that threshold that will allow us to go back on campus and uh, hopefully take our mask off by then. But uh, that's my hope and this is what we're working on. Uh, Bob is asking again, I see more urgency to the worldwide need for vaccination to reduce likelihood of new variants. Uh, or at best, it will require a continuous scenario of playing catch up to develop new vaccines to stop the new variants. Okay, Bob, the issue is, I, I like your idea of new variant vaccination, but I think that there's one point that's missed here, that new variants will not occur if you just vaccinate with the current vaccine. So the current vaccine has shown that variants will emerge. So and there's cross product, uh, uh, protectiveness around this. So instead of now playing a wild goose chase and now creating 15 different vaccine, uh, vaccines, let's go with what we have. And once you read, uh, reach that threshold, what I was talking about, you address the variants in a very fundamental way. And then you will deal with kind of uh, variants that uh, might escape vaccination, which I hope they will never. And then we can adjust the vaccination to that. But you cannot branch out right now with a different vaccination, different variants that come up in India or in, in Great Britain or elsewhere, our vaccines are pretty effective. 96% is a really good chance and they share epitopes even with the Delta variant. So I think let's go with the public health recommendation before we go into different variants in different countries because they all have 
target the spike protein. And there's only so many amino acids that the spike protein can encode. And the epitopes there that elicit these antibody or immune responses are, um, are shared among those variants with a couple of exceptions. So uh, I agree with the global problem, but complexity needs to be addressed with a, a, a deliberate plan uh, and first reduce uh, the core of the infection throughout the world before we then go into uh, the uh, more exotic cases that COVID uh, will bring upon us. What do we know uh, about long-term effects from having COVID? <clears throat> to be honest here, I mean, long-term effects, it's kind of a hard question since COVID is only about a year and a half old. So uh, long-term effects means five to 10 years. So we know that there are post-COVID syndromes, you know, that affect uh, a lot of our, I mean, there's a lot of things reported and, um, you know, there are recommendations to create post-COVID clinics to look at, uh, you know, chronic fatigue that look at uh, unspecific symptoms that you typically see after an infectious process. So these symptoms are likely due to you know, some degree of autoimmunity or damage that the virus has caused in certain, um, in certain parts of our body. Uh, we don't know anything about long-term effects, but what's concerning right now are more autoimmune effects, endocarditis, um, you know, the loss of smell and taste in some that is reversible. Uh, we, we saw, uh, you know, particularly in patients with more advanced disease, some bizarre abnormalities that affected hands and toes uh, that affected the uh, thrombotic or the blood clotting system in our body. But I think these uh, effects are more geared towards those with late stage disease or with more severe disease, you know, that, um, you know, a part of a cascade of cytokines that are released in our body. So uh, the bottom line is we have less long-term effects if we address COVID earlier other than, you know, if somebody has to be kept alive on a ventilator for a couple of months and survives and then deals with serious side effects, not just based on the virus, but also on, you know, the, the ventilation issues that um, uh, people have. So uh, the long-term effects from vaccination are really interesting because, again, this is part of the approval process. Um, Tim Canova here. Um, the CDC's uh, database shows more than 9,000 have died in the US shortly after getting one of the COVID vaccines. A Harvard study concluded that uh, self-reporting system about one to 10% of actual deaths are serious if, uh, side effects. Shouldn't be concerned. As I said, so I, you know, the not arguing with you that, uh, you know, the death rates after getting the vaccine, but I mentioned before, you know, some of these patients, you know, probably had COVID, you know, in their system beforehand, and then the vaccine applied after you contracted COVID cannot do much because it's not fast enough to create any, an antibody response in an acute COVID setting. So you cannot just, you know, make the vaccine uh, responsible for those cases where you contracted COVID then got vaccinated and the vaccine didn't have time enough to really uh, protect you. I mentioned the vaccine is more geared towards the spike protein that is protective and the immune response really just inhibits the virus from attacking your body because the virus cannot bind to certain binding sites that you have. So these are two different mechanisms that you're referring to. And um, I'm not sure whether I answered your question here, but I think that the issue is that if somebody dies after COVID vaccination, it is not from the vaccine, unless you know you have a severe uh, allergic reaction or a, something that is expected from a vaccine to be life-threatening, which is virtually almost nothing, but it is something else that is affecting either your immune system as an immune compromised patient, you had COVID before and the vaccine didn't have enough time <clears throat> to fully kick in and it makes takes six weeks you know, for a vaccine to kick in. So uh, that's why we have these two vaccinations. So uh, just make sure that the facts are clearly identified. You know, if there is a, a, a bad reaction or a death, you know, and establish the link to the vaccine, I think the, 
the, the issue is that there are very little vaccine related deaths to report uh, worldwide because uh, it, it, uh, history and science just hasn't shown it yet. Um, no need to share my name. Okay, I won't do that. By the way, this could become an ongoing conversation that uh, discusses the issue from an academic research perspective. And as you could be a leader in our community by offering thoughtful, neutral research-based topical conversation each week and bring in experts. Uh, you know, I anonymous uh, contributor, um, I agree with you. I think we could be leaders in many ways. And uh, it, uh, you know, the issue is just, we have a lot of things going on on our campus here, uh, but I agree, protection from future pandemics is key because I think that uh, the pandemic taught us a lot of things. Um, and I think we have to develop checks and balances here on our campus to deal with that moving forward because um, whatever the origin of COVID is, and it could be an engineered virus, uh, these things will um, uh, you know, influence the future uh, not just global uh, warming, but also pandemics. I think we are exposed to a lot of risk and uh, we just have to figure out how to prevent this. I'm a big believer in prevention and uh, I think uh, developing preventive approaches for upcoming pandemics, particularly as they affect the elderly and susceptible and vulnerable individuals uh, is very key. And I think this is also according to our core mission here at NSU. Oh, Carlos is telling me it's the final question. Program closes shortly. Um, what are the COVID, post-COVID symptoms folks, physicians are worried about? You know, are, the, the symptoms are very unspecific and I don't, we don't even know yet how this all plays out, but you know, uh, there are mental issues, uh, depression, uh, you know, uh, changes in your perception, uh, that may or may not be associated with COVID. It might be, you know, due to the circumstances that COVID put us in, you know, with isolation and other things, but I wouldn't really um, ignore uh, particularly, um, you know, uh, mental health issues that may emanate from COVID. Uh, chronic depression has been mentioned. Uh, uh, chronic fatigue has been mentioned, you know, that may take quite some time after viral infections for, um, I don't want to put out comparison, but you know, um, there are certain diseases, autoimmune diseases that cause chronic fatigue. And uh, I think we should um, always suspect kind of a smoldering immune response that also could tackle our own tissues that continues after COVID subsides. But um, you know, the, uh, there's a plethora of different complaints, concerns after COVID that are very unspecific. Um, that deal mainly with psychological issues, that deal with uh, fatigue, lack of energy, uh, and some chronic pain issues that I don't know whether they are attributable to COVID or not, but I think that's a science project that should be started um, prospectively. And I think NIH is very interested in that, you know, how we, uh, what the, the fallout from a infection with COVID uh, would be. So I don't have a global answer to this. I just know that a lot of people have a hard time to recover from COVID, uh, you know, whether it's COVID related or not. Uh, I leave this up to future studies. All right, I think that's kind of uh, what I'm allowed to say. I hope you found this informative and uh, uh, I enjoyed responding to all your questions. And we're right on time. Uh, and uh, I've just shared a few links. We've got a link for uh, if you're interested in vaccination at, uh, with NSU clinics uh, for faculty and staff and, and students, of course. We have uh, VaxMax, so you can uh, make sure you visit that link and also uh, the Dean's blog. So please uh, do share those links, uh, share with friends that might need uh, a vaccination. And, um, I'm looking forward to a full return. Thank you, Dr. Vivek. Thank you. Thank everyone online. Thanks. Our program is now closing.